everyone. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> okay, then. So, I'm in a tent on top of the highest mountain in Britain. It's winter. Outside, it's snowing. The temperature is minus five degrees and getting colder with every passing minute. Yet how I feel is utterly incredible. And that's for two reasons. The first is by doing this, I know that I'm raising money for young homeless people. And the second is because I'm having an adventure, which I firmly believe is the single most fastest way to boost your self-esteem, your confidence, and make you feel utterly unstoppable. But I wasn't always this way. I grew up in a small town in North Wales on the coast that, where most people claimed benefits. The national press even called us Costa del Dol. I was constantly told that as someone from that place, as a young woman, I couldn't, wouldn't, and shouldn't ever make something of myself. And then I discovered wild camping. This is camping away from a proper campsite, taking minimal equipment, and going far into the wilderness by myself. I'll never forget my first wild camp. All manner of things that could go wrong went wrong. I got sunburnt, I got eaten alive by midges, I even got chased by a sheep. <laughs> but when I got back to my car and caught sight of my sunburnt, bright pink face covered in insect bites in the rearview mirror, I knew that even though I'd never looked less glamorous, I'd never looked so good. I felt invincible. I had found my own way through the mountains. I had carried my own pack. I'd had to make my own life decisions without input from anyone else. I felt like somehow I was completely unstoppable. And I started to push this. I wanted more. I pushed my sleep to the very extreme. And here's the thing. When I did these adventures, I also found that my other passion for writing, photography and broadcasting, became successful in that field too. It was as if I'd had a superpower. But what to do with it? I decided to pass it on. Picture this. It's freezing cold. And by freezing cold, I mean it's minus 30 degrees by the thermometer. But it feels like minus 50 when you add wind chill factor. I'm walking and skiing clumsily across the ice on my way to the North Pole. It's completely white. I'm anxious with every single step. One, because they're a polar bear in the region. I know because I've seen the tracks and I've seen them in the distance. I'm anxious also because I'm walking across frozen ocean. Now, the ice can be a centimetre thick or it can be six metres thick. Every single step brought two things. It brought anxiety and it brought this sense of joy. I've made another step. That's one less step to go in this journey. I was anxious because I knew I had to make a next step, and that next step could be the one that saw me fall through the ice. Fast forward from day six to day 22. I arrive at the pole. Day 23, 24, 25, I fly back to the UK. I get back to North London, where I, was, where I grew up. I decide that this adventure is now going to be a force for good. I'm going to use this adventure and all the others that I've been on to encourage, inspire, uplift, empower the youth in my area, Hackney. If any of you have heard of Hackney, you know that it's synonymous with one thing, youth violence. I wanted to change that, and I decided that adventure was going to be the vehicle that I used, because I knew adventure could be a force for good. I want you to think about something for a minute. If we were to ask you to draw a picture of a typical explorer, what would they look like? This is a question that both me and Duane have asked school children and adults alike all across the country and they never draw anyone that looks like me or Duane. As you've heard, we've both been on very different carousels of life, but we found a way to get off and turn things around. And we've hopefully shown you that anyone can be an adventure. You don't need to be that old fashioned idea of a superhuman explorer. So seeing as you know that you can be an adventurer too, and I just wanna say that doesn't mean you have to walk to the North Pole or dangle off a cliff face. It can be something as simple that pushes you out of your own comfort zone. Maybe that's climbing a local hill. Maybe that's going for a walk after dark. Or perhaps it's going for a camp in your own garden. 
So now that we know everyone here and beyond is an adventurer, we all now have a superpower. But what are we going to do with it? I'd like to suggest that instead of planting a flag like this explorer behind me, we instead think about planting seeds. So what does a good adventure look like? Well, me and Duane firmly believe that every adventure has to have three main elements, which make up a triangle, which happily for us is a wonderful shape of a mountain. The first aspect of this triangle is going to be a personal challenge. It could be mental, it could be emotional, it could be physical. Oftentimes on adventures it is physical. It could be uh, psychological, learning to get back up when you trip and fall, learning to pick yourself up when there's no one else there to tell you to get up, learning to get out of that warm, safe tent every single morning and go out into whatever nature has to throw at you. It's all about the need to find something else, to find another way to carry on is the, is the mental strength need. And then we believe a good adventure should have some kind of positive environmental impact. We believe that doing adventures makes people fall in love with nature. And when you love something, you will fight to protect it. And that's what we really need to do with our environment. And by protecting it, we're not only making sure that we as adventurers can go and enjoy it again, we're also making sure that future generations can go and enjoy it too, which is a wonderful impact to have. And finally, the last part of our triangle, it's about having a positive impact on the local community. Because who wants to go and do an adventure if it only benefits you? Back in the old days of, of old-fashioned explorers, we saw that this wider uh, impact was that a country would claim power or be able to claim an actual piece of land. But we're not about conquering. Instead, we intend to inspire. So what could this adventure triangle look like in an actual adventure? Well, for me and Dwayne, it was a seed of an idea to go and have an epic adventure ourselves, mm -hmm. but to somehow reach a vast more number of people than we could do ever on our own. Social media. In 2019, Phoebe and myself decided to go on an epic adventure right here in our backyard. We decided that we would do an Antarctic style expedition right here in Britain. Well, what does that look like? We traveled from the true north of mainland Britain, a place called Donnet Head in Scotland, all the way down to Lizard Point. It's a journey of about 30, a little over 1300 kilometers. We did it during winter. We did it with pulling sleds behind us. We did it planning our route as meticulously as we could because we didn't always know exactly what we'd face, just like we, would in, we wouldn't know in Antarctica. We did it carrying all our stuff. We, in the middle of winter, in the cane gorms, at minus 90, was it minus nine in the middle of winter? It was bitter. This is what we expected to find. The other thing is, we did it at a time of year when nobody else with any sense would have done it. <laughs> That's very us. Um, and while we were doing it, of course, we knew that walking as an environmental impact, if we think back to that triangle, we knew that the environmental impact would be low because we were walking, but we start to get to the start and get home at the end. So we chose to use trains. Even so, with the minimum carbon that that created, we both planted trees individually to offset any produced. The kit that we used, those sleds that Dwayne talked about that we pulled behind us on wheels, they were borrowed rather than made new. And all our kit was recycled. We also harness the power of social media to spread the word about conservation and environmental initiatives that were taking place all up and down the country. We started in Scotland with the seabirds who were facing real trouble because of climate change, having to fly out further to find their food. We then talked about when we were in the forestry area about how new tree planting is great, but a lot of the tree guards use the plastic and no one is going and volunteering to take them down. And aside from that, we would highlight rewilding projects and really small local level initiatives going on and present that to a much wider mm -hmm. audience. Antarctica is this place that many people see as a myth. Most of us in here probably never thought about going there, but that's where we decided we would be raising money with our walk across Britain to take a group of underprivileged young people from right here in the UK. They would learn all those important skills that they need during this expedition, because we know the value of it. And if you're wondering why underprivileged young people, it's because it was a personal love of ours, but mm. also, if you think about it, if you're worried about where your next meal's coming from, where you're gonna buy that next pair of shoes you need for that job interview, 
How on earth do you have the privilege to think about what kind of environmental impact you're having on the planet? You have much bigger things to think about. By taking these young people from these communities, we were going to be giving them a global view. We're going to show them that what we do here in Britain impacts the rest of the world and how what happens in the rest of the world impacts here. And by doing so, we'll create a massive network of future adventurers who still follow that same triangle that we do. So, from a single seed of an idea that started off small, we had already raised the money to take 10 underprivileged young people to Antarctica. And now we already have a team together, ready to go in November. So what will the adventure do for them and the wider world? Well, let's think back to that triangle. Well, let's think about this. All the things I mentioned before, when you're a young person, all the skills that you need, those all important skills for life, self-reliance, resilience, uh, uh, confidence, teamwork, this expedition is going to provide all of that. Think about a job interview that you've been to. Think about the questions that you were asked. Tell me about a time that you faced a challenge. How did you overcome it? Tell me about a time when you had to work as part of a team. Tell me about an instance when you needed to set a target. How did that go? Tell me about a time when you came up against something tough and how did you overcome that? All the things that they'll be doing on this expedition, from doing citizen science with mm -hmm. meteorologists, ornithologists, geologists on board our ship, they're going to be seeing a whole wider thing of what to do, learning new skills and sharing it with other passengers on board. We're also, of course, thinking about the environmental impact, and that's why we are planting an actual forest. We are getting these young people to plant actual seeds um, to offset all the carbon produced by the expedition. We're also taking a hybrid ship, which has been named the most environmentally friendly expedition ship in the entire world. All our kit is made from recycled plastic bottles and made using sustainable manufacturing practices. But there's more. Every single one of these young people will take something away. Like Phoebe mentioned, they'll be talking to people who they'd never, never otherwise get the opportunity to speak to. Everything that ends with an ist, basically, they'll be talking to. So these are people, like geologists, meteorologists, marine biologists, deep sea bi biologists, you name it, this is what these young people will be uh, interacting with. They'll be doing talks, both in person and using technology. This is going to be one of the most mind-blowing, life-changing experiences for these young people and their communities. And the best thing is, we're not getting them to pay any money to come. But they will be paying it forward, but this time with deeds rather than actual cash. Take, for example, Rio. She's from Birmingham. What she's decided to do is harness together the power of her whole community, young and old, and get them to do regular litter picks to collect single-use plastic bottles. She's doing this to offset all the plastic bottles that would be used to make the entire team's kit. But there's more benefits that are happening other than that. By getting her community together, she's getting everyone to work as a team. They're going to areas that they may not even have known existed could be so beautiful, and they're cleaning them up and making them better for everyone. And they're seeing the impact that a single supposedly harmless plastic bottle can do when the culminative effect happens. So by her project, she is widening the net for people who are understanding about it, and she's gaining some life skills too. We've got Melos from London. Now, Melos is this extraordinary young man. He's decided that he's going to work to get his school green flag status. Now, that, he can't do that alone. He's empowered his family, his friends. The teachers are supporting him to make this happen. Think about what happens if he pulls this off. Other schools in the area will follow. Then we have from Scotland, Daniel. Uh, Daniel lives uh, in a place, it's quite, um, it's quite a poor rural area of mm -hmm. Scotland on the outskirts of Glasgow, and he's quite near the River Clyde. Now, he noticed that the River Clyde, no one ever sort of walks around that part of area. It's quite barren. So he got everyone together he possibly could in his village to create wild seed bombs, and he is getting them all to walk up and down the river bank planting these seed bombs. By doing so, he's improving the local area for everyone to come and enjoy. But also by planting these seeds, he's creating vegetation, which will offer shade to the river, bring with it more fish. More insects are going to come to pollinate them, which in turn will bring birds and mammals too. So he's not only changing his whole community outlook, but he's providing a really healthy ecosystem there too. We've got Elise. Elise lives in Nottingham. Now, the great thing about what she's doing is 
she's thinking about the cost of living crisis long before it was ever a crisis, the, 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 the cost of living crisis. She's got her grandmother to grow all the vegetables that they eat as a family. She's taken that model and brought it to school. So now other kids in her school are getting their families to do the same thing. And the school has now adopted this model and they're growing all the food that the students eat. The great thing about this is it's good for the school because they save a lot of money. It's great for her family because they save money. The school's money can go into other projects and it also means the food miles which create carbon have now been reduced. That's just four examples. If you think about it, what started as a seed of an idea between just us two people has spread already. We passed it on to 10, they've passed it on to their communities, and we intend to do this every single year. It's all about planting a seed to create a network, using adventure as a force for good. There is a wonderful saying that we really love, that wise people plant trees whose shade they will never sit under. And think about that tree. Not only does it provide shade, from the sun and the rain for thousands of people over its lifetime. It also provides shelter for wildlife and it also captures carbon emissions as well. So by doing a small deed, by planting that seed, we're creating a legacy that will last much longer than us. Every single tree of that size will capture roughly 20 kilograms of CO2 every year throughout its lifetime. A tree like that will live for 400 to 600 years easily. Now, Every single person that we can give their strength to through the use or through the medium of adventure, it's good for that person, it's good for their families, their communities, and from what you've seen from just the four examples we've given you, the wider community and the world too. So we just want to leave you with this thought. Think about the size of an acorn. It's a tiny seed. It fits in your hand. Yet that grows to be a mighty oak that lasts for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and benefits way more people than just the individual that planted it. Think about that. By planting a seed, we can all leave a legacy. What will your legacy be? Thank you.